Jeannie, choir, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Good morning. Welcome to Mattituck Presbyterian Church. We're delighted that you're here with us in worship. Just a few announcements before we begin. The first is that this Tuesday is the third of four times together for Spirit Fire. If you haven't come, I'd love for you to come this Tuesday evening. Um, starts right at 7, we end by 8.30. It's a time really just to get acquainted with who is the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit do. Final Saturday in March, beginning at 5 o'clock, we'll have a light dinner and then we'll have an evening just of extended praise and worship, time to sit and be still, to receive what God has to give you. Also, time of prayer for healing, for inner healing, for physical healing, whatever you need. If, if you're coming out of a season where you feel, I need that, that's a wonderful time to join us. Um, and to come and to pray together. Um, we're going to be serving breakfast, our famous Palm Sunday breakfast, beginning at 8 a.m. 8 a.m. to 11. Um, so that's Sunday, April 10th, Palm Sunday breakfast, Jeannie Berliner. Ah, oh, it's fantastic. Would love for you to join us. Reminder also that every Sunday in Lent we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper. So if you're spending time fasting from those things that are getting in the way of your walk with God, if you're fasting, be sure to come and feast with us uh, on the Lord's Supper, the bread, the wine, the body, the blood of Jesus Christ. Our belief is that God himself is present and ministers to each of us, giving us the nourishment, the spiritual nourishment that we need in the Lord's Supper. An announcement, some sadness, but also thanksgiving, is that Dottie Falser, longtime member, deep woman of faith, died on Friday evening at 9.15. I had the opportunity to visit with her a couple of times since coming here, and Annie Hawkins um, is a neighbor and has been an excellent um, sister in Christ to Dottie. So we, we mourn her passing. We're also deeply thankful for her life and that for her now, pain is ended, and she is in the presence of her Lord and her, lo her loved ones as well. Will you please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship? printed in your bulletin. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name forever. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. Our first hymn is A Mighty Fortress, number 151.
Please be seated. And please join me in the prayer of confession also printed in your bulletin. Merciful God, in your gracious presence we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and have turned them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us, heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Now let us continue our personal confession in silence. Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let's share a sign of peace with one another.
Let us return to God our tithes and our offerings. Father, we pray, bless these gifts to your use and us to your loving and faithful service. Keep us ever mindful of those in need and all those who are near and dear to us. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Please be seated. Last week, we looked at what it means to be raised to new life, to become a believer in Jesus Christ. And it means a transfer from death to life. Um, it means God comes in and without respect to what we've done, right or wrong, says, you belong to me. It's God's grace is visited on us and we become a new person in Christ. When that happens at the same time, the Holy Spirit takes up residence within each of us and begins a lifelong work of transforming us. That's what we're gonna look at 
today. So once that happens, okay, then what? What happens? What does the Holy Spirit do within us for the rest of our life? I'm going to read from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and in it, there's this contrast. There's a lot going on in the passage that I'm going to read, but at the heart of it is this contrast. Two different kinds of ministry. A ministry that leads to righteousness and to life, and another that leads to death. And at the heart of that difference, those two different kinds of ministry, is this. We become who or what we behold. We become who or what we behold, what we look at. Listen for those themes as I read. Again, Paul says a lot here in this chapter, but in a nutshell, that's the concern that he has, and at the end of it, it's the solution that he presents. We're going to read from 2 Corinthians 3. It's page 1177 in your pew Bibles if you'd like to read along. Paul writes, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you're a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of the human heart. Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He's made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has now glory, has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who had put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. We become, we become who, what we behold. Behold, it's kind of a biblical, it's an old word. And it means more than to look at occasionally or even to look at every day with kind of mild, moderate interest. Behold means to gaze intently, to look longingly. Because you want to be like that person, you want to be with the person you look at. We tell a story that I think illustrates this. Katie Heron lived the first 15 years of her life with her zoologist parents in an African jungle. But in her 15th year, she returns to America. She's got to learn the real rules of the jungle. She's got to learn to be a teenager in high school. Not easy. Doesn't take long before she meets two friends, Damien and Janice. But Damien and Janice, they're part of sort of the out group, the out crowd. They're not part of the in group, the popular group. 
not long after that, Katie meets three girls called the Plastics, sort of the beautiful, amazing, um, popular girls, Regina, Gretchen, and Karen. They let Katie into their group, so now she's a part of the in-group, but Katie still wants to keep her old friends, right? the nice people who let her in, the out-group. The out crowd thinks it might be fun for her to say, go ahead, go be friends with these folks, but do it in order to kind of find out their secrets and we'll publish them. Things don't go as planned. Katie falls in love with Regina's ex-boyfriend, Aaron, it's one of the popular girls' boyfriend, and then Regina finds out and tries to get revenge. What, became, what began as a game to discover secrets turns out to a plan to destroy Regina. Katie as she spends more time with the plastics, kind of the popular girls, she begins to become one of them. So I won't spoil the ending for you, but this movie is called Mean Girls. Yes, Shauna knows, Mean Girl, yeah, absolutely. And it's a big shout out to, my, so your pastor has not watched the movie Mean Girls, uh, but I was struggling for, <laughs> I was struggling for, I was like, how am I gonna explain this? And my wife was like, Mean Girls, let me tell you the story of this movie. <laughs> so I know she watches, and anyways, yeah, so. Katie thinks that she can become like the popular girls, but kind of keep the part of herself that is good, that's faithful, that's true. She can still be true to her real friends, but the more time she spends looking at, kind of becoming like the plastics, the more she turns into one of them. We become who we behold. Sometimes the consequences are perfectly awful. But when we see Christ clearly, when we're transformed by his spirit, his commands, his law, then become not a set of rules kind of detached from who he is, a set of rules for kind of self or spiritual improvement, but we hear them as the good shepherd's own voice speaking to us in times of need, in times of encouragement, in the way that we might remember the words of a loving parent or a good coach when we launch into some crisis. To see Christ clearly, Paul says, the veil has to be lifted from our eyes. We must be born again, as we talked about last week, raised to new life. Again, that word, that phrase, born again, has kind of come under a lot, like, what does that mean? What do people mean when they talk about it? It simply means to be raised to new life with Christ. Sometimes that's a dramatic experience. Sometimes it's a gradual, quiet one. But there is a beginning to our walk with Christ where we stand up and say, you did this. It's by your grace that I'm alive and that I'm here. And then you begin to walk up with him. Here in Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church, he shows us why that's so important and what results from it. So when that veil is lifted, we leave behind paths of death and destruction, and we become more and more like the one we behold, Jesus Christ. So if you missed it, that's what Paul is speaking about in the final verse of that chapter. We all, who with unveiled faces, contemplate, look at the Lord, are being transformed into his image. Ever-increasing glory comes from the Spirit. So the word image there. Greek word is icon, icon. If you come out of a Catholic or an Eastern Orthodox background, you know how important icons are. They're paintings of people from the Bible, the history of the church, that believers use in their devotion to God. The belief is that these kinds of paintings bring the presence of God to the believer who prayerfully engages them. Here in 2 Corinthians, though, Paul is saying we have one icon, the icon of God, Jesus Christ, the one that we should fix our attention on to become more and more like him. It's a significant difference between Protestant tradition, the Catholic, and Orthodox tradition. For us, Jesus Christ, as he is attested in Scripture, is the icon. When we sit before it, we know the words and the example and the spirit works in us, we are transformed. So Catholic and Orthodox Christians, though, believe their icons, they're not just paint on canvas, block of wood, it's a dynamic, living something through which you can be 
transformed spiritually. It's like art, you're, it's dynamic, you're transformed by it. Does that remind us of anything that's maybe more modern? It's not religious, but it works in the same way. Television, right? movies, social media, each of these are icons. You can think of them as icons of the people who own and offer that media to us. They mean for us to be transformed by their icons, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. So listen to what these icons, these kind of secular icons, would say to us. You don't need to engage, much less love that person that you disagree with. Just listen to what we think you should think about them. You don't need to go be part of a real live church. Just come here every Sunday morning, watch it on video, get fed, because church, after all, is about getting what you want. Last one. You don't need to work to build a local community of substance. You can have that online at a much lower personal cost. When we sit long enough in front of those icons, the results are on display for all to see. So which icons do you sit in front of? How, if at all, are they changing you? Our icon is Jesus Christ, as presented in Holy Scripture. To know him personally means to have his life, his words, front and center in our lives, in our words. And in all of that, to welcome the Spirit's work in us so that we become more and more like him over the course of a lifetime. We can know his story. We can even have his words memorized and yet still not be growing in Christ-likeness. You've met people like this, right? It's the Spirit who takes the words of Christ, helps us to weave them into our day-to-day life so that even when we don't have a specific word from Jesus that applies to this situation or that one still we're able to serve we're able to live after his own heart let me explain what I mean my observation is that in marriage we often need to know what our spouse wants or needs without being specifically asked to do that particular thing without having to name it we just sense after living with someone for so long that she needs a day away from the kids, right? Or needs to be listened to and not offered a solution. Or if it, let me tell you how to fix that, honey, right? Always a big mistake, always a big mistake. <laughs> or she just needs flowers today, right? You live long enough with your spouse, you behold them long enough, and that includes talking, of course. You know what needs to be done without being told specifically what it is and when to do it. Clear communication, of course, absolutely matters. But we should be able to get to the point where we know. We just know this is what she needs now. Likewise with Christ. The Spirit, through intimate knowledge, the words and life of Jesus, lead us day by day more and more to know, yes, this is the right thing. This is the faithful thing to do now. No, no more of that. Leave that behind. It's the process of maturing in Christ. A kind of big word for that is sanctification, to become more holy. Again, holy, another one of those words, sort of gets a bad rap, holier than, don't pretend to be so holy. I know who you are. Stop being holier than thou. But biblically, to become holy, it means a couple of things, and they're both very good news. The one is to become, to be given power and direction to leave behind stuff that's destroying you spiritually and to become more like our grace-filled, our good shepherd, gracious, forgiving, gentle, humble. In your work in life, wherever you are, wherever you are, wherever you work, to become more like him. That transformation, that privilege, it's not just for a few people. Paul's fighting against that idea when he contrasts Moses and us, and we who receive the Spirit of Christ. He's saying that every believer can, every believer should experience that transformation. 
Paul has in mind a story from Exodus 34. Moses is coming down from Mount Sinai. He's gotten two new tablets after kind of destroying the other ones in anger. He comes down. His face is radiant from having been with God, talked with God. He's been transformed physically, so radiant that the people kind of draw back. They don't quite know what's going on. He's entered the presence to speak with God, to behold God, and he's been transformed. Moses, though, is the one. Moses is the one who enjoys that kind of face-to-face -face time with God. He can speak with God and transforms him. It's kind of a holy radiation that he draws near to. That's the pattern in the Old Testament. The prophets, the priests, the kings, those are the ones who are able to enjoy that kind of encounter with God, individual people. When we read in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, so toward the end of the Old Covenant, this promise that one day all God's people can know God, know his glory as Moses did. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. I will put my law in your minds and write it on your heart. So instead of delivering a list of rules, of commandments, God himself in his spirit will write them on our hearts. That's for us, for we who have accepted Jesus Christ, who walk with him day, day by day. Whenever we turn to the Lord, turn away from spiritual death, the veil is taken away. That's what Paul is talking about. The veil is lifted. We're raised to new life. Because that veil is lifted, we now look on Christ face to face as we see him in scripture and as the spirit transforms us. When we behold the face of Christ, his words, his deeds, we invite the spirit to transform us, then we're able the change that happens, it can look like this. We're able to sit down with that person. It's a very different view on the matter than us. And listen, without judgment, without compromising our values, but without judgment. Then we're able to go, right? Be part of that imperfect kind of messy church because we see, we confess, we're imperfect. We're messy. We can go into the community to meet our neighbors in need and simply help them without seeking reward or renown. Come sit before Jesus Christ day by day, week by week, as we find him in scripture. Come to the Lord's table where, again, our belief is that he's come to minister to each one of you, to raise you to new life, to strengthen you in your walk with him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to invite our elders forward to help serve the Lord's Supper. Oh. <laughs> Hear these words of scripture. Jesus said, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Let us pray. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He lived as one of us. He knew our joy, our pain, and sorrow. He died our death. By his death on the cross, you revealed that your love has no limit. By raising him from death, you conquered that last enemy. You crushed all evil powers and gave new life to the world. 
in his victory, you comfort us with the hope of eternal life and assure us that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. In this sure trust, let us now offer our joys and our concerns in silence. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, upon these gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name, that we may be one in ministry in every place and time. Amen. The Lord Jesus, before he was Betrayed before he was crucified, gathered with the disciples in the upper room, and after breaking, after blessing the bread, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup. And after blessing it, he said this. This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of this, do this also in remembrance of me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. We have gluten-free if you'd like that. And if you would, raise your hand and I'll bring it to you. Christ broken for you. Body of 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 Christ broken for you. The 
blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. As soon as you receive it, you may take it. shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Please take the hand of someone close to you as together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand for our final hymn. 